All right, so for those of you who uh, do not know me, I think most people do, but uh, if you're visiting or if you've just been attending for a short while, uh, my name is Jeff Wilder. I've been an elder here uh, since the beginning. Uh, I guess it's been over, I don't know, 15 years now. Uh, it's, it's been a long time. Uh, but I'm normally asked to preach maybe a couple times a year. Um, I love to teach. It's, it's, it's become my joy. Uh, you can ask my Sunday school class that I come in and I'm always just so happy to be there because I love to teach. Preaching, not so much. <laughs> uh, that's, that's not really my thing. But, uh, but I do love to share the Word of God. So it doesn't really matter uh, if it's to a lot of people or a smaller group. I love to talk about Jesus. So uh, I hope you see that excitement in me. I hope you see that I have a passion for that because I do love to share Jesus. Um, so in all of that, we'll go on. Um, today I'm preaching on the Beatitudes, and I, I came up with some corny thing just because that's who I am. Uh, I, I'm a big dad joke guy. I love dad jokes that are, you know, clean but really corny and you know, you kind of chuckle and say, that's really bad. But, so my title today, as y'all saw on the bulletins, is it's the be attitudes, they're not the read attitudes. That's funny. Okay, well, maybe it's not funny, but. All right, so the reason why I said that is because we have read the be attitudes in the Bible, I don't know how many numerous times. I mean, I've read them, I don't know, 20 times probably. And we've been taught, uh, you know, you've heard somebody teach a lesson on the Beatitudes probably numerous more times. Uh, but the question for us today is, what are they? And how do they apply to our lives if we are a believer in Jesus Christ? What are the Beatitudes? What are they? Um, I'm reading a book right now. Me and Wade Allen are reading a book by this guy named John Stott. Um, it's about the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and it, it's, a, it's just an interesting book. Um, he's got some really good insights. And he said that the Beatitudes are qualities that we should strive to attain as a Christian. I mean, that's pretty simple, right? It's pretty simple. Um, when I started looking at these things, I, I, I was like, okay, the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are merciful. I, I'm kind of merciful. But one of the big mistakes on the Beatitudes is we look at them like they're individuals, and we can pick and choose which ones that we want to be like. That is not the way it is. That is not what the Beatitudes are for. We cannot pick and choose one and say, hey, we're going to be this one or be that one. Jesus wants us to be all of those. All of them. So if you want to look at it, they're more like the fruits of the Spirit. Like when you have the fruits of the Spirit, you have the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the self-control. All of those, and that's not all of them, but you have all of those things. The Spirit gives you those things. Now, the, the spiritual gifts are different, okay? Spiritual gifts are, you might just have one you might have two, you might have three. If you're blessed, you have four. But, but you might only have one. Those are spiritual gifts. That's a little bit different. This one, the Beatitudes, we should e exemplify all of them. All of them. So, you can't pick and choose. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, believers will acquire them only through the submission, the trust, and faithfulness to God. That's how we get them. That's how we get them. Um, now, this is a, a, this is a very rich scripture. It is so full. Uh, if you read about the Sermon on the Mount, you could preach on just small parts of the Sermon on the Mount for hours. Uh, and I'm trying to look at all of the Beatitudes as a whole uh, just in 30 minutes. So we're going to have to go pretty quickly. It's going to be like a 10,000 foot view. Uh, I'm not going to get so in-depth that you're like, oh, this is, you know, everything 
about being poor in spirit because many, many preachers have preached two and three sermons on just being poor in spirit. So I'm going to go kind of quickly, but um, anyway, let's get started. Blessed, that's how it, they all start. They all start, blessed are those. Blessed. Well, if you're going to start, you have to figure out what does blessed mean? What, 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 is, what is blessed in this context? <clears throat> if you look in the Greek text, which I'm not a, a Greek scholar by any stretch, but I did look it up. Uh, there's a word called makarios. Makarios. Um, it actually meant, uh, in Greek society, the upper echelon of society, the wealthy. That's what makarios meant originally. Um, I guess that means fortunate, right? If you're wealthy and you're in the upper echelon of society, you are fortunate. Uh, you don't have to work. Uh, you're rich, wealthy, have servants. You don't have to worry about your meals. Uh, that's fortunate, right? Uh, some people define it as happy. I don't know that I'm in that camp. Um, uh, there's others that define it as the opposite of being cursed. I could probably go with that a little bit. But uh, the more I read about it, uh, the more that I, I studied, um, blessed came to this conclusion for me. We are very fortunate to be in a relationship with the creator of the universe. And that's where I stand. That's fortunate. That's blessed. If we're in a relationship with the creator of the universe, that's blessed for me. Anybody disagree with that? I think that's pretty straightforward. All right, so <clears throat> my wife and uh, a lot of her um, small group are, are, have been studying Scripture. And, and the small groups for the men do the same. Uh, we've been learning Philippians in the, um, in the men's group. And the, and the women's group are learning 1 Peter. Uh, I have listened to my wife say that Scripture I don't know, 20 times. Pro I probably should do it more. I apologize. Um, but she, is, she, she astounds me at, at what she can remember. Uh, the guys are not doing as well. Uh, I don't think we, our minds work as well when it comes to memorization. Uh, but, but she has been memorizing First Peter, and she's like into the second chapter now. And it, it's, it's amazing just to hear the Scripture come back to you just as memory, no, no Bibles around, just, just regurgitating the Scripture back. It, 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 it becomes you. It becomes a part of you. Well, there's this verse in there where it says, and you are to be holy as I am holy. It's a call to be set apart as believers, to be different from the world. And the Beatitudes differ so completely with what the world was looking at at the time, uh, they differ so completely from uh, an unbeliever's thinking in an unbelieving world. Um, there are nine of, nine of them. Uh, really, there are eight. There's one that's restated at the end about being persecuted. Um, the first four really describe a person who depends totally on God. So if you look through them, there's a dependence that, that you have to have God for, for these things to be revealed or to get, or, or it's the way you approach him, it's the posture that you have when you approach his throne. Uh, so the first four kind of deal with that, and then the last four are very much like Jesus. Jesus was merciful. He was, he, you know, Jesus wasn't poor in spirit. <laughs> uh, so, so the last four are more like Jesus and the way he was, so us trying to conform to, to Jesus. Um, the last four show us what it looks like to a, 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 of a person who has truly accepted the demands of God on his life. Um, I'm just going to touch on the, the blessed part of the Beatitudes because the rewards part are totally different. Uh, that's another sermon altogether. I would never get to it if I touched on everything. So uh, we're going to just jump right in, and uh, we're going to concentrate it on the blessed, okay? Um, poor in spirit. 
uh, we see the, the scripture up, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, one thing to note, the reward there, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that's future tense. And the first one and the last one are showing theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's future tense. And all the ones in the middle are present. So that tells us that the kingdom of God is here and it's in the future. So it's eternal. I like that. Uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, when I was growing up, uh, when I looked at poor in spirit, I didn't really understand what that meant at all. Um, Jesus was always pleased with somebody that came up to him that exhibited spiritual bankruptcy. He was always pleased because they showed a need that they needed him. He was always glad about that. It means that you are poor in spirit, not that you're poor in the Holy Spirit, okay? So don't get that mixed up. Blessed are the poor in spirit, that's your spirit, not the Holy Spirit. Um, we're not talking about the Spirit of God when you were talking about being poor in spirit. Uh, a great example is this. Um, Isaiah is my favorite book in the Bible. Always has been, probably always will be. In Isaiah 6, it says, In the year of the king Uzziah, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were angels with six mighty wings. With two he'd cover his face. With two they would cover their feet. And with two they'd fly. And they would say back to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Mm, that's good stuff, man. It's just good. It's just good. And then the foundations shook. And Isaiah says, Woe to me, for I am broken. And I am unclean, and so are all my kind. But my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. All right, so poor in spirit, that's poor in spirit. Isaiah was one of the best orators in the world. He had access to three kings. He was an important man. He had, I mean, he, he had control. He had influence. And when he compared himself to the greatness of God Almighty, he was wrecked. That's poor in spirit. Because compared to God, we are nothing. Prostrate. Y'all know what that means? If you actually look up the definition of prostrate, it means your nose to the floor. That's how we approach God Almighty. It's the only proper way in His greatness that we show that we're nothing without Him. That's poor in spirit. So, that's what it means to me to be poor in spirit. Okay? So, the next one, blessed are those who mourn. When I was growing up and I would read this scripture, I'd always say, blessed are those who people who mourn over people that died and you loved them a lot and you mourned over them. That was a child's way of looking at that. That shows that you have love for somebody. And I think, you know, Jesus loved people. He mourned. The shortest verse in the Bible is he wept, right? That's not what this means at all. Um... Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, we're talking about sin here. He's talking about mourning over your sin. When you are in comparison to God Almighty and you see how wretched you are, it exposes the darkness of your sin. God is a light that exposes how dirty and dark we really are. And once we are there, uh, we can see that it's mourning over our sin. Um, an unbeliever mourns over great losses. So, so we're talking about believers here. We're talking about people who are followers of Jesus Christ. A great example is something that we just read 
uh, not too long ago in Nehemiah. Uh, I'm going to try to read this with my glasses. There's a glare up here. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of people, of his, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you, and even I and my father's house have sinned against you. We have acted very corruptly against you, and we have not kept your commandments, the statutes, the rules that you have commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah was mourning over the sins of his, his, his countrymen. He was mourning over the sins of Israel. But he didn't stop there. He said, me and my father's house have sinned against you as well. And he was mourning over that sin. Once the light of God shines on your darkness, it shows how wretched you are. And it brings a, a, a just a horrible conviction about how we should mourn over our sin. There's not enough mourning over our sin these days. We glaze it over and say, ah, oh, it's just a thing of the world. Everybody else does it. We, we relativize it, if that's a word. I don't know if that's a word. But but we rationalize it and say, hey, the world's worse than I am. But we should be mourning over our sin when we sin against who? God Almighty. We're not sinning against our brothers or our sisters. We're sinning against God himself. He mourns over other sins just like Christ did. Christ mourned over other sins. Uh, we talked about it in uh, Sunday school today where we're Christ was amazed at their unbelief. Um, but we should to mourn over our own sin. Christ didn't have that. So let's don't, let's don't get that. To, Christ didn't have sin to mourn over. Uh, one uh, quote that I really like, is, it's talking about confessing of your sins. It says, confession is one thing, but contrition is something else. Uh, we can confess sin. I'm very quick to say, yeah, I sin. But are we mourning over it? Or do we have a contrite heart, a broken heart because of it? Uh, Jesus did. All right, so the next one is meek. That is something that I struggle with. I am not a meek person. I, I don't know. I, I, I try to be. Um, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And when, when we say inherit the earth, we're saying inherit everything that the Father has. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that nice? Uh, meek doesn't mean quiet and unassuming. Uh, I think somebody said don't, ex don't, uh, don't mistake meekness for weakness or something like that. I think that was a... Um, meekness is also defined as gentleness in the Bible. Uh, it's, it's more like this. <clears throat> when I go to my, my group uh, on Sundays, um, if I'm struggling with a particular sin in my life, we, we confess it to each other. And then we pray over each other and say, look, you know, I'm struggling. I, I was very angry today or, or whatever it be, uh, you know, and we confess it to each other. Now, I'm very quick to say, look, I did this. I have sin in my life. I do. Everybody does, right? But it's a, it's a whole different animal when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, <laughs> I saw some sin in your life, and you need to get rid of it. Now, how do you react to that? Some people are like, oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I saw some sin in your life, too, you know, or, or something like that. It, it's a, a different thing to be meek and teachable and humble. 
when somebody approaches you and points out a sin in your life, you have to be humble and moldable and teachable in that moment. And, and respect that your brother is trying to help you and love on you because he wants you to conform to the image of Christ. That is a different ball game altogether. That is meekness. That is being moldable and teachable. Um, I never really saw it as that. Um, this goes against the world. The world is self-promoting. The world is combative. Uh, the world is without gentleness. So God wants us to be meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. After you're emptied of all the ugliness after you've been compared to Jesus compared to God and you see that you're spiritually poor and bankrupt and then you mourn over that sin and then you 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 see it to a point where you're actually moldable and you're teachable you're empty at that point so what what do you do when you're empty in the hunger you, you hunger for something you're ready to be filled with something else Blessed are those who are a hunger and thirst for righteousness. At salvation, uh, this is one of my favorite things. Uh, at salvation, the Bible says that the laws of Moses are written upon our hearts. We know what is right and what is wrong because the Holy Spirit is there to convict us. Once the Holy Spirit indwells us, we know the law. We know what's right because God's telling us what is right. The Bible tells us what is right. And we hunger and thirst for his word. I love that. I, the last two years, I have been just diving into the word of God in ways that I've never done before. And it's been amazing because it's changed me. It's changed me. So, blessed are those who hunger and thirst uh, for righteousness. It's beautifully restated in, in, in Matthew 6 when it says, But God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall I eat? What shall I wear? What shall we drink? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all, is his, all of his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. There's many different types of righteousness. There's legal, there's moral, and there's social righteousness. Uh, legal is a right relationship with God. That's the way I see it. Legal is in the Bible, the right relationship, the right response. That is worship. It's the proper response to God. Moral is doing what pleases God. So there's a moral code in the Bible as well, and it tells us how to live our lives. And then social is how we treat our fellow man, how God would have us treat our fellow man. So there, there are many different types of righteousness. But, but understand this, at salvation, he imputes righteousness on us. We're, who is right? No, not one, none. Only through Jesus Christ, only through the blood are we righteous. <clears throat> the last four of the Beatitudes are very Christ-like. If you go through and read through them, uh, being merciful, I mean, who had more compassion than Jesus Christ? Being pure in heart, a peacemaker. He was called Prince of Peace. And being persecuted. I think we all know how Jesus was persecuted. Um, it led him to the cross. This is where things start really coming together when I was doing my study. And when we compare ourselves to God, we can see our depravity our poorness in spirit. It will cause us to see a darkness, our sin, 
and in his light will truly mourn that sin. Then we become humble and meek. We become teachable and moldable in his eyes. Then we can turn to him and his word and understand what is truly right. Then we can re- enjoy the reward statements. That's salvation, guys. The reward statements all throughout the Beatitudes is salvation in Christ. That's the reward. Are you going to be with him in heaven? That's the reward. Being with Christ is the reward. None of these rewards are going to be earned through works. Not one. They're all earned by the grace of Jesus. The grace of God. The mercy of God Almighty. It's only through the blood of Christ and his work on the cross that we acquire these qualities. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We should show compassion for people because we imitate Christ, and he showed compassion. When we are meek, we can have our own sin acknowledged. But when we are merciful, we can forgive the sins of others. My mother loves flowers. She loves them. They're everywhere. And if you ever go visit her, you look around the front of her house, and there are beautiful flowers everywhere. Her mother loved flowers, and I think that was a genetic thing. I mean, there's there's beautiful flowers everywhere. And she gets them from friends, and she'll root them, and she's got a green thumb. Julie and I will kill any flower that ever enters our house. We have ferns, and sometimes we water them. But Mom has these beautiful flowers, I mean, like, Fox gloves. I mean, just gorgeous flowers all the time. And my dad loves to keep the yard clean. So what does he do? He's like, well, I don't like to weed eat. Who does? So he sprays Roundup. Well, he killed one of mom's, like, best flowers. And my mom showed forgiveness. She was like, it'll be okay. And then the other day he ran over a pot of flowers that she had been rooting and whatever. She showed forgiveness. I'm just saying my mom's a good example of mercy and forgiveness. Um, I'm going to move a little bit quicker because it's 11.55 and we've got a lot to do. But um, the last three are, are much more clear. The last three Beatitudes are very clear because they're imitating Christ. They're imitating Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. David prayed for a pure heart. Uh, right when he was delivered from Saul, he, he, he said this, he, this beautiful psalm, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift his soul up to what is false and does not swear deceitfully? He will... Receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God, the God of Jacob. The pure in heart, this is what you have to know about the pure in heart. They seek God's direction in all aspects of life. That's it. It's pretty simple. If you seek God's direction in all aspects of your life, you can attain pureness of heart because it's God's pureness. It's God's will on your life. David was seeking the pureness of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, when I was in high school, I was not saved. I loved to stir up trouble. I know it's hard to believe, but I love to talk junk. I started probably 30 fights in high school, and I was never in one of them because I was small. But I love to say, are you going to take that? Or, I can't believe he just said that about your mama. And then I would say, are you uh, really? That, that's who I was. I know it's hard to believe. 
But that's who I was. I loved to instigate things. I was like, I loved to stir it up and, and cause chaos. But you know what? When I was saved by the grace of God, God called me to be something completely different from that. It's not enough to like peace. I am a path of least resistant sky. I'll tell you that right now. I like things to go smoothly. If things start getting crazy, I'm like, okay, I'll just go out here. And if, you know, I, I like things to go smoothly. But it's not just enough to like peace and peaceful things. It says peacemaker. This means you intercede on the behalf of a friend and you take the high road and you love on them when they're not lovable. Blessed are the peacemakers. That's a hard thing to do sometimes because, you know, people are tough. When you disciple someone, it's probably one of the hardest things to do in the world because you're investing in their lives and you're taking all of the ugliness and you're helping them sort through it through the Word of God. That's discipling. It's hard and it's messy. But you know what? They're worth it. God sees everybody as valued. It's worth it to be a peacemaker. It's worth it. I'm going to give you a freebie. Darren always gives freebies. Uh, I don't want to be different, so here's your freebie. If you bring somebody the gospel, if you tell somebody about Christ, you bring peace into their lives, guess what? It's the gospel of peace. Tell somebody about Christ. If you want to bring peace into somebody's life, tell them about Christ. It brings peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, there's a couple of bookends here that I couldn't get past when I was studying. Uh, first, it says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The very first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's bookends there. It's talking about future tense. It's talking about being in heaven with Jesus Christ. But there's also another bookend. If you look at verse uh, of the fourth beatitude, it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I never really noticed that before. In fact, last night at 3 a.m., God said, look at this. What is righteousness? Why are they persecuted for righteousness' sake? And why do they hunger and thirst for righteousness? Well, let me tell you. He gave me this little revelation. Mercy. The mercy and forgiveness. The pure in heart. Seeking God's, seeking God's direction in all your life. Being a peacemaker. Those are definitions of righteous. Those are Christ-like attitudes. They are the sheer definition of righteousness. So if you imitate Christ and you are in cohorts with Christ, I, cohorts is not a really good word, if you are walking in lockstep with Christ, that's better, you will be persecuted because Christ was persecuted. He was all those things. And if we associate ourselves with Christ, there will be a day where we, be, we will be persecuted. It hadn't happened yet. But I had to ask myself, why hasn't it happened yet? Well, the answer is not a good one. Not for me. 
The answer is, are we look, do we look that different from the world? Because if we don't, we're probably not going to get persecuted. Man, that convicted the fire out of me. Do I look different enough from the world? Do I look like the Beatitudes of Christ? Man, it, I, I don't know that I do. There's nobody throwing rocks at me. There's nobody trying to put me in jail because of my faith. Is my faith radical enough? Is it that different from the world that people notice it that much? If you are poor in spirit and you mourn over your sin, for the world and yourself, not just your sin, if you are meek and you're gentle, if you hunger and thirst for God's righteousness in your life, if you show mercy and forgiveness to people who are hard to show mercy and forgiveness to, if you create peace in a world of turmoil, if you look for God's direction in every part of your life, you will be persecuted. It's going to happen. The Beatitudes is a beautiful walk through salvation, guys. If you look at it and really study it, you know, you, you see who God is and who you are compared to Him, and then you see your sin, and then you, you mourn over your sin, and then you get moldable and teachable. It's the salvation experience. It's God taking us into salvation. About, I don't know, Quite a few years ago, I was at a place, uh, there was a, a sermon going on. And there was an evangelist, and he, he gave a sermon of three chairs. And it, it had a huge impact on my life, because it, it was exactly who I was at the time. And he said in those three chairs, there are three different types of people in the world. And I, I, think, I think you were there, weren't you, John? So John was even there. John and Griffin were there. Griffin was probably really little. But anyway, so at this sermon, he said there were three types of people. There are the people that have fruit in their lives, that, that you can see Christ in everything they do, and they overflow, and their spirit overflows on everybody, and there's love, there's forgiveness, there's mercy. The fruits of the Spirit abound. He said, you see those people right away. My grandmother was one of those people. I could see it right away in her. She loved everybody. And you, everybody knew it. This is not the person I'm talking about today. And then there's a person who's going to bust hell wide open. This is somebody who is blatant sin everywhere. You know that they're sinning. You know that there's sin in their life, you know that Christ is far from them. Those are the people we need to evangelize to. Those are the people that we need to say, hey, you need Jesus Christ in your life. That's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to see. The middle chair is the scary part. The middle chair is where I was for 30 years. 30 years. This is the scary part. If you looked at me on the outside, I looked like the best church-going guy in the world. I was the sweetest guy. I was polite. I opened the doors for all the ladies. I gave every old lady a hug. I went to Bible school. I was, every time the door of the church was open, I was there. I had none of those attributes. None. None of those qualities, not pureness of heart. I didn't mourn over my sin. I was not meek. I wasn't any of those things. In fact, if you looked at my friends outside of the church setting, you couldn't tell me from the world at all. Those are the scary parts. Because guess what? Someone who loves Christ and is going to share Christ is not going to share it with this person because they don't look like they're not saved. It's a scary part. It's a scary place to be.
Thank God the Lord didn't leave me there. He left the 99 and he went and got the one. Thank God. But guys, don't play church. Don't be the one in the middle. If you want to exemplify these things, pursue them. All of the rewards and the blessed are those is salvation. They all have to do with the blood of Jesus Christ. They all have to do with the grace of God. There's nothing you can do to earn them. Nothing. Except love Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Have faith in Jesus. Trust Jesus. That's it. And once you do those things, all of those will be easier. They're still hard. They're still hard. So I'm going to pray. Uh, if you ever have any questions about salvation, what it means to be a follower of Christ, come and see me. Come and see Darren. Come and see one of the elders, one of the deacons. Let's sit down and talk about it. It's too important. It's the most important thing in the world. Father God, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that as we try to conform into his image, Lord, we will go through trials. We will be persecuted. But Lord, the rewards in heaven are great. Lord, we'll get to be with you. Last Sunday, we talked about your face being the sun. In heaven, there will, there will not be a sun or a moon. Your face will shine. How awesome is that, that we get to be with you, to give you crowns, like we sang about. Lord, I, I, I pray that I have crowns to cast at your feet, because you are worthy Father God, help us to be and exemplify the Beatitudes. Let's just not read them and read over them and, and not look at them, Lord. Let's, let's strive for them. Not because it earns us anything, but Lord, because we want to conform to the image of Christ. Father, we love you, and it's through your name and your sake we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks.